Hi, it's Christy Moan back again with another Coffee Talk, and this week we're focusing on tough conversations, and we're joined by Lucas Moody with Crosswinds Counseling and Wellness. He's the um, Development Director. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you. I appreciate you having me and being willing to have this conversation. month we're talking tough conversations. Um, each month um, you're getting an email from us that goes over some, some topic that we think is kind of important and this month we've got um, tackling tough conversations. So we looked to a local resource and brought in Lucas Moody from Crosswinds Counseling and Wellness. He is the development director for them. Thanks Lucas. You're welcome. I appreciate being here and uh, this is probably one of the areas that I uh, I enjoy more than other people enjoy. So <laughs> I like I like having tough conversations. Uh, I think there's a little bit of an art to it, but I think it's something that with a few skill sets from people, you can pick up on it fast and kind of understand some basic do's and don'ts with it. Awesome. Yeah. So just like, let's just jump right in. All right. Um, what are some of your tips when you're looking at tackling a yeah. tough conversation? So I would say that with, with all conversations, I think that um, sometimes we, as naturally as humanistic as we are with, with uh, feelings and emotions, that we allow sometimes those to guide the conversations. And so, you know, in, in, in my house and especially in the work that I've done in the past, because I've been in this field for about 22 years now, I always tell people that sometimes we have to step back out of those. And so we have to start going back to that, that basic I statement. We have to use the I statements instead of the you statements. And, mm -hmm. you know, the I feel like, or I'm stressed out, or this is how I'm feeling in this situation, or this is what I'm scared of right now. Um, and when we use those I statements, it really allows the other person to have a really nice vantage look on how we're feeling and assess the situation so that they can gauge where we're at in that conversation. And so I would say that some basic rules would be a lot of I statements and not you statements. And I would say that sometimes we, you know, you're a bike rider and you know, you, you, you always have that, when you get tired, you gotta push through. When you're there, you just gotta keep going and keep pedaling. I think some of that's great when we're doing those endurance sports or we're having those tough times. I think that when it comes to conversations, sometimes we have to be able to say, you know what, I need a break. I'm gonna take a break, let's step away from this for a minute regain a little bit of composure, allow ourselves some, some, some room to breathe, and then come back to the conversation. And I think it gives us a different vantage point. Um, I think sometimes it allows us to process our emotions because we all process a little different. Mm -hmm. Times when I'm emotionally worked up and having those conversations, giving it a little bit of space and giving it a little bit of breath allows both of us to come back on the same page and understanding each other a little better. So when you know you're getting ready or you need to have one of those mm -hmm. tough conversations, what are some of the things that you can do yourself and even potentially the person that you need to talk to to kind of prep them to know that you're going to go in sure. to have, have a successful result? Yeah. So I would say in, in, in the scenarios and situations that I've been in with tough conversations, I always try to go into it with the facts that I'm not there to sway their opinion. I'm mm -hmm. not there. I didn't go into the conversation with an agenda. Um, I try to be open-minded because I know that I'm going into a conversation with a vantage point that's mine. Um, and the reality of it is, is that a lot of decisions and a lot of conversations require more vantage points and more emotions and more feelings than just my own. Um, and so typically whenever I would say I go into a tough conversation, I always try to preface it and even start off by saying, this isn't going to be fun and this isn't sure. going to be easy. I'm really nervous in this situation telling you this, but it's because I care for you and I love your family or whatever, but we need to have a conversation. So this is kind of where I'm at with. I want to put it out there and then I allow some silence. I try to be quiet, give them time to process what we're talking about, um, and then really kind of start diving into to the communication. Can you tell me how that makes you feel? Because I know how it makes me feel, but I don't you. Can you talk to me about about mm -hmm. your vantage point or your, your, your outlook on this situation? Um, and then I, my job is to be quiet. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's a job of, in, in a time period where it has to be active listening. Um, it's not listening with an agenda. It's listening to their perspective so that I can absorb that knowledge as well. If things are going south, like mm -hmm. you've started this conversation and you went in with all of the good intention, yep. 
and, and things are taking a turn to the south, what are some tools we could use to potentially either turn that around or, or change, the, change the flow of it? Yeah, I, I really think that it, with any of that time, using space can really give mm -hmm. you uh, the ability to kind of take that emotions out of it, to take that, um, even, if it's, even if it's just uh, anger or animosity building up, a lot of times when we build up those internal characteristics sure. inside of us in conversations, mm -hmm. It's really because either A, we're getting uncomfortable or we're getting aggravated because we're not being heard or this, the conversation isn't going the route we intended it to go. Stepping back is a really good opportunity to remind ourselves, I didn't go into this with an agenda. I went into this being honest and open and wanting to have a conversation. Conversation is a two-way thing, not a one-way right. thing. Um, and so I really think that space is probably our best issue. You know, we've got holidays are coming up and that's going to be <laughs> a, a, a prime topic where we all get together. Well, for my family, we don't get to see each other all the time. Um, you know, there's always going to be topics that I say that we should avoid. Uh, politics is a big one. Religion's a big one. Um, but I think there's some great topics that we can go into events like that kind of pre-planned for. I think travel is a huge one. I'm, we just started talking about it and we were even visiting in here earlier today about, uh, you know, what's the next trip you got planned and where are you going? And then we can talk about the food and the restaurants and the scene and, oh, I've never been there before. And those conversations tend to not have as much um, emotional tie uh, to a negative aspect of it. Um, and so they're, they're great conversations to kind of kind of continue to push push things in a positive direction. New Year's resolutions, what are your goals for the new year? Where do you wanna be? How can I help support? Um, all of those type of things really lend, lend an opportunity to continue to have a close relationship um, and, and enjoy the time you have with each other without it being spoiled with over emotional conflicts uh, and tough topics of conversation um, by, by giving yourself a little bit of breather mm -hmm. and having some topics ready to go that can kind of simmer things out a little bit. Well, and I think everybody comes to that table obviously with a different skill set. Sure. And if you're the one, if you're the one that in the family is the mediator, mm -hmm. um, what are some tips and tricks that you could give that person to pivot the conversation mm -hmm. if they see it um, yeah. going towards politics or, you know, or a topic that you know is going to end up mm -hmm. causing hurt feelings and and, yeah, you know, super high emotions. So I think one of the big things with tough conversations, um, it, when we get on those topics that, that, that may be starting to head down a tougher path than mm -hmm. we really want to be, um, I really think honesty is probably the best route. Um, it's just to say, hey, guys, we're together right now. I want to spend time with you. I want to enjoy this. I know that we all have some different outlooks and I know we all have some different views. This is probably something that, you know, we can talk about in short, but I'd really like to open it up to some other things. I want to know how your kids are doing. I want yeah. to know how work's going for you. I want to know, you know, where you're traveling, what you're eating, are you guys meal planning, are you not meal planning? I, being able to pivot some of that yeah. stuff, I'm also a big humor guy. Like I'm, I'm a person that likes to, you know, say something that is almost so off-putting sometimes that everybody kind of steps back and laughs a little bit. <laughs> I think you have to be in the right crowds for those type of things, but I think you can be around people that, that um, you can sense when things are getting a little too tense and a little bit of humor can go a long ways with it. Um, but I also think just being very open with it, saying, you know. Wow, we, let's talk, let's let's pivot here. Let's take a step back here for a second. <laughs> Probably not the topic that we want uh, to enjoy our time on. And yeah. Then, and then have those other topics right. in your pocket. And you it doesn't start. mean that you can't come back and talk about those things at 100%. a later time when, yeah. when, you know, things are with yeah. different situations, yep. obviously. We, obviously. We also, you know, my, my mom and I are, are prime examples. <clears throat> we have... Um, conversations around politics where we both align and we find we find common ground with each other but we also find conversations to challenge each other in viewpoint oftentimes when we're doing that we're doing it we're having tougher conversations sometimes when we're doing something that we like so mm. baking would be a prime example we like to cook when we're, she's down so when she's down and we're cooking we're in the kitchen You're having tough conversations. we're having a tough conversation in an environment where there's an easy escape back to the food hey can you read me that recipe again or hey can you feel this bread does it feel like it's ready to go we have that escape ready for us um, I always say that there's times where tough conversations are harder um, but I'm a car ride conversation I like to have conversations in yeah. the car but I know it's also really easy to, to pivot and say, hey, did you hear that new song? Or did you know that so-and-so put out a new album? Or do you have that book on CD? Like we can always go to something um, that, that, that has an environment that allows us a little bit of escape built in if we need it. When do you think, um, 
what signal should, would there be where you would know we need someone to step in and help us have this conversation? Yeah, so I think that there are, I think there are things that we have to ask ourselves. Is this, is this important to me? Is the outcome of this conversation important to me that we align equally in, 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 in sight and understanding of where we're at? Or is this a conversation that we're just going to differ in? Um, I, I mean, I spend a lot of time with people who have very different views than me sure. sometimes. And I think even within that different view and, and within that realm, I have to understand that the outcome is not going to be that we see eye to eye 100% sure. of the time. Yeah. So, you know, there's situations like marriages, relationships, things like that. Sometimes it's nice to involve a different perspective. Um, we communicate differently. And so yeah. when, I, when I went to college, we, we had this old, um, this old kind of a, analogy and saying, and, and I, we use it in my house all the time. It's called uh, Mrs. Mister. So it's message sent, message received, message received, message sent. And so the, the whole baseline of that is, am I sending the message in the manner I intend to send it, but are you receiving the message in the, in, in the manner that I intend to send it? And if not, then we have a communication barrier. Sure. Sometimes those can be solved just by you and I having uh, an open conversation and saying, you know, I know you said that you really don't like me and you want me to leave the house right now. But to me, I took that that you don't want to be in a relationship with me anymore. When, when my message was not that, my message may have been, I just need some space because yeah. I'm frustrated. We were able to work through that with some, with some proper communication. Where we have to involve those neutral parties sometimes is when, when maybe – our communication is not being understood back and forth, even though we feel like we've tried. Sure. Um, and so sometimes just involving a neutral person to say, hey, you know, Lucas, what I heard you say was this. What they heard you say was this. Was that what your intent was? Well, no, that, of course that wasn't my intent. I love you. I want to be with you. Then you open that conversation through a neutral party being able to say, well, what's a different way that you would hear that if Lucas said, hey, I needed some space? How could he say it in a manner that you would receive it differently, mm -hmm. uh, in the manner he intended to send it? So I live in that Mrs. Mr. world a lot, um, just because I think that sometimes we have the tendency, and, and even me, I have the tendency to say something, but if if, it, if the yeah. intention isn't being received properly, then then it's not my my message was wasted. Anyway. Yeah, got it. Um, pivoting a little bit, you work at uh, Crosswinds Counseling huh? and Wellness. Like, let's give everybody kind of a little bit of overview of what you all do and sure. some of the services you all offer. Yeah. So uh, it's it's a community mental health center. So the entire state of Kansas is covered by community mental health centers. Um, we all function just a little bit different. Our center is a uh, a local nonprofit. Um, so we were uh, established uh, many years ago and have grown drastically. We're pushing 200 employees now. We cover seven counties. So we cover Lyon, uh, Chase, Morris, Wabunsee, Osage, Coffee, uh, and Greenwood County. So we have 200 employees almost that, that kind of cover that whole area. So Community Mental Health Center is really um, the, the basis of, of what we do is community. Mm -hmm. We provide services to anybody and everybody that needs it regardless of their ability to pay. We have sliding scale fees, we take insurance, and we offer a multitude of services. So whether it is group counseling, whether it's grief counseling, um, whether it's uh, kids, adults, those are all things that fall into our wheelhouse. Outside of what people typically think when they hear mental health, which is therapy, there's a lot of other things. We're in all the school districts in all seven of our counties. Uh, so we have staff that goes to the school and meets with kids uh, and awesome. provides supports in schools. Um, and, and then we, we work with adults who have uh, severe and persistent mental health, whether it's housing and trying to get them established so that they can become you know, the, the member of society that they want to be through supports and things like that. So there's a, there's a, a, a multitude of different things that community mental health centers uh, provide. We serve over 3,500 people a year. That number is continuing to grow. Um, and uh, just like mental health, I think COVID was one of those things that yeah. really gave us all this step back and said, you know what? It's okay to look out after me. It's okay to have needs. It's okay to ask for help. Um, and I think people are starting to realize that more. Um, and so I, do, I don't look at growing the mental health world as a bad thing. No. I look at it as a self-care <laughs> thing that we're, we're recognizing that it's for okay sure. yeah. for us to take care of ourselves. Yeah. Awesome. So where do people find you? So our, our website is a great place to go. Great. It's just www.crosswindsks.org. Um, it's got everything on there for the most part. It talks about our services. One of the really nice things that I like about our website is we have some 
kind of uh, self-assessment tools in there. So you can actually click in some of our assessments and, and talk about depression, or you can talk about anxiety and ask some questions and says, hey, yeah, I think maybe this is something that, you know, this was kind of what you scored. I think this would be something that maybe you should take a next level and be able to talk to somebody about. Um, you can book an appointment on there, uh, and then it's got a ton of different contact information for us. We're a center that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Awesome. So we have a crisis team uh, that is always there, whether it's through mobile communication, through uh, a laptop and a computer or a cell phone, or it's somebody that needs to be there face to face. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We want to make sure that we've got somebody there in case somebody needs us. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining You're us. You're welcome. I appreciate it. I think this is uh, a good conversation to have uh, even outside of the holidays. I think these are just uh, nice conversations that help us communicate better and continue to grow. Couldn't agree more. All right. Thank you. Yep. <laughs>